Uh, as always, uh, the, uh, this past Thursday is brought to you by Gray Block Pizza. Gray Block Pizza is that pizza establishment when you're driving around and you're thinking about doing crime or, you know, even thinking about just sleeping in your car or doing nothing and not even taking care of your family. Change those feelings. Go to Gray Block Pizza, 1811 Pico Boulevard. Get that hitter, boy. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Can you hear me, Nick? All right, we have uh, our second guest ever that is going to come into studio in just a moment. And this man is a beautiful man. And I'm going to tell you that out of the gate. And this is Mr. Tate Fletcher. And just so you know, he has a really solid uh, MMA background. And I'm reading some of this information. Um, he started at one of the best MMA gyms in the world. And that's Jackson Winklejohn. From there, he became one of the best grapplers in the world. Becoming a champion. He played an important role in shaping MMA. Uh, he competed on UFC's reality series, The Ultimate Fighter. But I, I don't even know him from any of that. Um, I know him. He's a, he's, he's a Hollywood stuntman. And I know him through, um, through self-help and that sort of thing. And uh, just, you know, I have not had a, many conversations with him. But every one I've had has been a little bit of a guiding light for me. And I'm happy to have him uh, here in studio today. So let's welcome Tate Fletcher. We're live. Live. Wow, we're live, man. I'd like to walk in live always, but it always seems like there needs to be a startup. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there needs to be an intro. No, when you came in, I mean. Like well, I wanted to be in, I wanted to be in with like the hood on, you know, I just want like maybe Unabomber a little bit, but then yeah. a little bit. I've been, I see, I watched television recently. I was a little sick and so I was on the, uh, on the Netflix. Okay. Do you not usually watch it? I'm not into. I, I. I mean, I'll go to sleep with it sometimes, but generally, I'm not. I'm not in that mode, you know, where television is part of my daily shit. However, I'm in it, and then I saw this thing, Rapture. Have you seen that? Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. It's got Nas and Jungle and Dave East and. Uh, now what are these T. rappers? I, uh, yeah, and and it's a little. Uh, it starts off with that with that kid logic, mm-hmm. and he's dope. And so it's a it's a pretty cool little documentary type piece. And in Ti's, it talks about you know going from kind of a a trap rapper to to kind of more social consciousness kind of tip that he's on. And uh, I watched him, and he was the second guy I saw that wore sunglasses through a whole interview. He had these real nice Ditas on. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man. And then I was like, because you always think that guy's a dickhead. Yeah. You know, if he's got a sunglasses on indoors, like, yeah. that's a certain type of fella. Like, yeah, it seemed like somebody, I mean, it's, I mean, the easy answers are witness protection, Italian. Um, what else outside of that? Oh, sometimes senior citizen wear those. Might go Armenian too, a blue blocker. Oh, yeah. A blue blocker. A blue situation. blocker. And then you just forget, maybe. Devout Armenian, like a devout yeah. Armenian. And if you're an old, you got your regular spectacles on, and then you put the blue blockers on, you just maybe forget when you walk in and yeah. it's at twilight or something. You don't know. Yeah, when you're old anyway, you can wear whatever. I if mean, you're I remember in the club. It's kind of like a guy that might have an Under Armour long sleeve number on compression gear mm-hmm. at the club. Oh yeah, that's same, too much. Same type of fellow would wear the glasses inside or in, in, until I saw, like I said, until I saw Ti do it, and then I was like, well, man, maybe. Maybe you can do it. Maybe I can do it. Well, it doesn't seem weird to me to, to have you in it. Because here's the thing. I just thing. feel like it's disrespectful that I don't see your eyes. But then I'm like, you know I love you, so like, it's okay. But like, if I were to meet somebody else, I'd be like, hey, how you doing? You know? Right. It's different. I think the the thing is, yeah, to me it doesn't seem weird. I'm going to go out. Now I think it's weird. Now I have, I'm just going to. Well, don't let me forget those, though, because it's still bright I won't. outside. Commenting on what you said, um, and this is Tate Fletcher is here with us today, guys. And... Uh, and thanks so much for coming in, man. Yeah, man. I really appreciate it. It's good to Dude, be here. Good stuff. Um, and you know what? I didn't think it was weird that you had on sunglasses because, yeah, like you said, I trust you. And I know that you're an okay person. I guess if I didn't know that or if I didn't think that, then I would maybe wonder what's going on. Yeah. You'd have a thought about a fellow like that because you'd had – is he's not Italian. I right. I know he's not. Yeah. And – not Armenian, no. even though he is friends with Sam Tripoli. You yeah. Know, whatever. Yeah. But that's just acquaintance. That's, that's just acquaintance. Genealogy. Yeah. That didn't get you in the uh, in the DNA like it's like, no. you know, like you need it to qualify. No, you're not rampant in my RNA structure, <laughs> dog. <laughs> um, now, I want, first, I want to ask you about the caveman coffee, because I, I just learned to, I just learned that you 
are one of the proprietors of Caveman Coffee. See that right there? I wear the CC on my chest. Oh, that's cool. Know? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't even notice that. See that there's a, another well-dressed fella in the room. And too. people, yeah, yeah. And uh, Nick is here. Nick, how are you? I'm doing really well. Th- thanks for coming in, Tate. Thank you. You got the gold and black on, which is a good, strong look. I like that one. I like that one, and I really like the black on black, too, but... It's my number one choice. Yeah, definitely. I haven't shrunk this one. I wear out that uh, black on black, but uh, the the gold in the back. This one makes a statement. It's good. It yeah. snaps. Yeah. yeah, we got some new stuff too. I'll I'll, I'll make sure that you guys get some. Yeah. No, yeah. I'd love to have a came in coffee stuff. The first time I ever heard of it, I was uh, when I went to Joe Rogan's podcast, A and I. I've heard he has. And one. And they had, uh, yeah, and they yeah. had. It was like a little, kind of just like a fancy little can, I guess, that maybe like somebody with overweight. small hands would use president of the united states a little bit like a little people say it's me people say it's trump it's chris farley people say it's you of course it's chris farley but i mean okay. it's like if trump took a wrong turn that was another thing i was watching there's a trump trump documentary that's out on netflix oh, really? too about the early days oh wow all through the 70s and 80s yeah yeah but that's probably pretty interesting i'm yeah. trumped out at that i mean just i'm just he loved that pussy all the time even yeah. back then he was he was really an admirer of uh the vag oh well paulie sure i know talks about um being buddies with him and partying with him you know and just yeah. like or, or just at least chasing chicks i mean trump doesn't drink i know can you imagine paulie and, i mean that is a vision a three-piece suit and then paulie shore hanging out <laughs> the, like yeah the wheeze, oh, the wheeze and the tr- like the, the donald i don't yeah. know that's a TV show. If they live together in a little house somewhere. I mean, that could be a show one day. Maybe it could a be a whole bedroom. network. Yeah. I'd watch it. So you had no idea I was a part of the Intel you're guzzling cans on Rogan. Yeah, I didn't, well, I didn't know that's the first time I ever had it. And I was like, oh, this is exciting. This is like a Did soda. You put a little salt in your Peter? It's like a soda that's a coffee. It made me feel, let me think. It made me feel like I was. Take it back. If you got to close your eyes and just. Let it wash over you a little bit. It may. Here's what it made me feel like. It made me feel a little bit pensive because I didn't know what a coffee like that could do to me. Right, right. I'd never had something like that. Yeah, might put a whack on you. You're not ready for like. It's not the one that you see coming that knocks you out, and you're like, I don't know exactly what's in there. That's dark water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to see. Yeah, I just didn't want to be like so nervous because I was already nervous because I'd never even really talked to Joe Rogan. So right. I didn't want to be. That can be a thing in itself. There's yeah. a, a weight to that. Yeah. That I think that it, you know. Any famous person never appreciates that you feel that way, but they always they know it. That's they, but fuck, that's got, that's a hard thing to wear. I yeah, think, you know. And I was like, yeah, how, uh, to have so much panache that you're like, people are uneasy. But then also, it's nice because people act better. Generally. Right. <laughs> yeah, people will put their best foot forward a little. There is a weird thing. I met Nelly last night. I saw that. Yeah, I was so excited, dude. And he's healed up. No, yeah, yeah. The band aid's gone. He's better. So I don't know what happened to him. I guess it was probably, probably talked to Maggie melanoma. Johnson. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> it could have been melanoma. I don't know. Um, but I noticed, though, speaking about, like, fame and popularity, I noticed, like, I gave him a, you, you know, like, he gave me, like, a hug. But I noticed I was talking to him because I performed recently at a casino that he performed at. And I noticed that he, while I was saying that, he couldn't hear me saying it to him. Like, he was in that weird, like, famous moment, like, where, like, he's you're just at, trying to be you're gracious. asking for a picture, and so he has to go through the drill right. that he's done 40 million times. Yes. Can it, how many times has he done it, really? Like, what's a number? I bet hundreds of thousands of pictures that he's taken with yeah, fans. Yeah, maybe 40,000. That's a lot. 40,000 is a lot. I mean, how many will, like, how many will Rogan do after a comedy show? Maybe 20. Or a hundred. Oh, if you wanted to stay and do them all? I heard, I heard, I've seen him stay for a long time. Oh, before. I didn't know that. I mean, I, I see people catch him in the hall and they'll catch him in No, moments. no, but like if you go see him in Texas or something and then oh, he, may he do, comes yeah. out and he might do 500. Oh, yeah. In that case, yes. <sighs> it may be that many. And so Nelly, it's like that for decades. True. 20 years. Crazy. Yeah. So but, anyway. But there was this thing he couldn't hear me. I know, And it wasn't that he was being rude or anything. He was... He was giving me all his attention, but it was that it was like this famous thing that I noticed famous people, they can't help where it's like, you know, somebody's trying to express gratitude towards you and like excitement about you and you want to be gracious towards them, but you can't really hear them because you're just you're almost going through emotion like 
you know, thank you so much right. for being We get to the supportive. picture, and then I'm going to shake his picture. hand yes. one more time, and then we're going to say goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your support. And then the next guy comes in, and right. there's all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's this weird thing. It's like... Um, <laughs> Do you, have you have you experienced that on the other side? I mean, of course you have. Yeah, I've experienced that over <clears throat> the years, like, uh, you know, growing up, you know, working on MTV, and we got... There was some height of popularity there where, you know, tons of people watch television, and and then now a little bit more with comedy, I'm noticing it happened more. But yeah, it's sometimes there's this moment where you it's hard to be present and gracious, a gracious act that you've done like a, a bunch of times or try to be present right. with, a, with, you don't want to say a fan, but yeah, with like a fan. It's hard well, to be but present. It's weird. Isn't it weird to think about that you got fans? I mean, a little like it's like it's weird, but that's what they're, they're here because they admire something they saw me do in a public setting. Or right. What I, like it's a it's a trip, man. It's like because you don't want to seem arrogant. Right, right. It's like yes, you, you do anything it's like it's not tough to seem to have arrogant. Like humility and admit that you have fans or whatever. It seems like, like a, it seems like your brain goes like it doesn't right. quite compute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is weird, and I guess maybe like supporters, teammates. I mean, there's different kind of terms you can use, but yeah, it's tough. It's tough to, um, yeah, it's tough because you you want to get support and you want to garner people that like what you do, but. You don't want to seem, you know, you don't want your ego to get infected. Right. Infected. It is a weird thing. And then there's that little thing where this doesn't feel, it's like skipping school. I'm never going to skip school. I'm never going to smoke cigarettes. Yeah. I'm like all those O's as a nine year old. Yeah. Or whatever. And then you don't skip school. And then you, you know, finally, you're like, and whatever, the right circumstances come up and maybe you skip school. Yeah. Sure is easy to skip school the next day after you skip it that first day, you know, but if you don't skip like it's like there's a block there. And and so it's hard to like temper the throttle, I think, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just keeping the throttle off. Like it's like abstinence in some ways is like that's really the only way I'm going to keep this ship together is like I can never skip school or else pretty soon I'm just not a student anymore. Right. And I think it's like a, it's a thing like like that, like you got to kind of, it's like, there's always, I don't know that ego. It's like this, the only kind of thing that has perpetual motion in this world is our ego. Yeah. And that grows all by itself without any attention at all. And actually it, the worst thing is, is the less you pay attention to it, the more it sprouts up, like the more you pay attention to it, that's the place to be, but it's hard and it hurts your emotions and it tears you up. And then you, it breaks you down again. And like that thing about getting yourself, I think physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, all in, in line is that it's never there. You've never arrived. You've got to tweak those dials all the time. Constantly. And on that, and, and you got to smash it. Like, dude, I'll tell you, I went, I did this. I saw, I, I got, no, and I love this combo because, no, 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 man, it's great. But, and ego is one of my biggest fears in life right amazing, now. Dude. Thank you. Those Converse. Yeah, they're Converse. And I just ordered a pair from China, right? And then the website that sent me a link seemed Converse real shady. Converse are already pretty cheap. You got to order from China. <laughs> look, I didn't mean to. <laughs> they're already $30. Damn, <laughs> well, look. <laughs> Now um, <laughs> you're outsourcing sneakers as an individual. Oh, I didn't mean to. I just ordered the first site that had them. So then this Chinese company sends me these shoes. It's not the shoe that I ordered. Right? That's not good, no. man. It's kind of like a China, woman's rain China, boot. Wherever you are, get, get it together. Yeah, and it's like, and now, and, but now they're asking boot. me for the money, and I canceled the payment, and now I feel bad because they're like, "We need the money, or my boss is going to be upset." And now I'm like, "You want to know what happened to me?" Because hmm. fuck them. That's yeah. what I say. Fuck them. I signed up at this god. You heard of this place, Equinox? Yeah. Ugh. Listen, I go in there because I'm maybe going to beat a bougie producer or something that's going to make me into Dwayne Johnson. I can't even stand to go in the place. Yeah. I mean, cucumber water is not really my jam. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, So I'm in there for a while, and I fight the good fight. And my buddy Rico, he goes to it out in Dallas. And so I, I figured it's an overall gym that you can go to, and I, that's where I'm supposed to be, right, in some way. Like the gym I work out at, we're on cement. We're outdoors. We got rocks and shit like that. That's where I, that's my wheelhouse wow. more, you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, I, I go to cancel there, and I'd canceled in November. And I uh, sent the email to the supervisor and to the manager and, and then they said, well, you're going to have to send a, a proof that you have a bill from another place. And like, I have a, a home, a business, all that in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was like, well, I'm just traveling. I'm on a job for work. I'll be gone on Waco for this next three months. And I can't, I'm not paying for this and I don't come here anyway. So bye. So we did all that. And then just yesterday I looked at my bills again and I go, how and come still I'm building. still getting charged? Yeah. And so then I call and I do the whole thing and they go, 
oh, well, we don't have that email. Can you resend it? And I resend it. And it turns out there was a, a letter wrong in the email back to them. And I was like, that sucks. And she says, listen, I'm going to come halfway and I'm going to give you half the money back. And it's like, it's like two yards a month, man. It's like $200, $210 a month or yeah, something. It's expensive. It's like expensive. Fancy. And so she's talking about like $400 instead of $800 or something like that. She, I was like, listen, like, I just got to say that this is wrong. Like you're, you're doing a thing as a huge corporate endeavor to do the wrong thing ethically. Like you're choosing the wrong value system. Like it's nothing to you to give a few hundred dollars back to not leave a horrific taste in my mouth. Right. And this just looks like your petty chintzy motherfuckers, right? Like you get that, right? Like, and really I just want them to know that they, but that's like that same thing. And that's like, if you're not solvent in your shit and that's not like, let's have an equitable deal. Right. If it's not good for both sides, it's not a good deal. And let's yeah. not do bad business. That would be called bad business. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, shame in Equinox. No, look, in Equinox, they used to have this man there that would wear, he wore headphones, he had on a neck. First he had on, he wore as much accoutrements as you could get. Mm-hmm. And first accessorized, he, one oh, of those accessorized fellows. Dude, he had the Horace Grant goggles, remember those? The mm-hmm. ones, like the first basketball guy, mm-hmm. like the Kurt Rambises. And, may, and maybe he put a little sleeve on just up to the elbow, oh, yeah. just so his forearm muscles didn't wear out and cramp up. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, but then he had on... <laughs> Uh, the thing he had on um, a bandana, and then he came out with like this sport neck brace or something. Like I guess he strained his neck, which I don't think he should be working out after that. No, he had on the neck brace, and then he would jump rope in the middle of the yeah, fucking there's... thing with a children's jump rope that had like the little like the pieces that separate, you know, the red and yes. white, red and yes. white. The children's. Oh, and every day people would video him and just make fun of him. And one day, finally, the rope broke in the middle, and just all the pieces. Those were it's like confetti. Yeah. And I ran up and grabbed two of the fucking pieces and put them in my pocket. Right in front of him. I never said anything to him. Right in front. Brazen. Just brazen. But I got that piece. I yeah. got I needed that. Yeah. Um but yeah, man, I wanted to I wanted to think about that ego stuff, you know? That's just I mean it's, it's one huge, of my biggest It's a it's, huge deal. It's an infection. The and, way it changes for me too is like after you get good like jujitsu is great for that for a long time. But like after a while that you're not terrified to do that and then it's just it's uncomfortable it's important to be that uncomfortable and to have that practice and to keep you there but like to go deeper then it's another thing and and like to expose yourself right in all the ways it seems like we feel like we should protect ourselves and really the the growth and courage comes from exposing ourselves everywhere do you have like moments in your life where you feel like you've had to do that kind of like always yeah i've had i mean you know you go from being like a junkie to a sober person to a barista to a professional athlete to running a business to like everything is like i'm not the thing i was you know because all the shit that i've done in my life has been like i was this thing i completely cannot be that thing anymore Mm. and so now you're this thing so it's not even like you're taking an old skill set and laying it over it's like you need to be brand new now and, and and that's a scary place to be. And like, especially like quitting fighting is a thing like that, where it's like guys will stay too long Yeah, because it's scary to find out who would I be without the adoration and the pride and the, all that stuff that having this moniker affords me. And so who am wow. I beneath all this? And so do you remember like some specific moments kind of that? Cause yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, I can imagine it's the same thing for you. You've been through it. I mean, even just coming off TV and then going, no, I really am a comic. I, this is what I want. You know, and then it's like you redrawn yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and I think that we we that are agile at life, that you can start to see modicums of success from. That's one of the skills is that you get agile at being able to act with decisiveness to become a new thing. Did you have to stop being friends with some, you know, to go back to the fighting yes. stuff? Cause I do want to in a little bit talk about, you know, the wild shenanigans that have happened with the, with the fight, you know, changing, um, you know, the new fighters this week and people slipping in and out and pretty crazy time, pretty crazy. But uh, to stay on what you were talking about. Yeah. It's so funny. I was thinking about that yesterday. I was thinking about, well, I wonder what that was like for Tate. Like, you know, to be involved in this. I mean, did you see that, that, MMA and the fighting and stuff was growing so much and and did you feel like fuck like I'm getting off of a space shuttle like or did you what was some of that or did you just feel like it was a it, I mean it was a ride that was like a regional ride that then you know when like guys like me Diego Keith Jardine Carlos Condit like all those guys started fighting that was we were watching the UFC and pride and things like that but like 
the SEG had owned owned uh, UFC at that time, and then it was dark for a couple of years until Zuffa came and picked it up, and so fights were their fighters were still fighting. Fighters gonna fight. Yeah, but um, the idea that we could be in the UFC or something like seems so foreign. You know, and then a bunch of dudes out of the gym became champions and shit there. It's like, and, and it, so it was that first UFC. It was like, that was them throwing a Hail Mary. Let's see if this will work and catch fire. Yeah. And then, you know, I was on the third season of that. And then, then it really started. And then you're going, yeah, you can see it's meteoric rise. But I mean, like uh, Chuck Liddell used to bitch all the time. He's like, great. I'm the best guy of this thing that a bunch of truck drivers like to watch. You know, he's wow. like, and, and he's like, so he just, you know. Was you know, and but it's like that thing, that passing. It's like now it's like this mainstream thing, and that's the other thing. That's why guys are going. You know, I'd like to take a swing at this again. You know, you get BJ Penn want to come back again. You get Anderson still in it. Leoto, these guys that could have gone away as ghost stories, like Hicks and Gracie, like just like uh, anomalies of nature, like you know. But Chuck stayed a, a few fights longer than that, and like, but it's easy to do, especially as the thing that you're about to be disengaged from is taking it's a fucking it's hard that's a i mean that's a hard choice for a fella to make yeah was it a choice did was that so was that like a you either choose to leave or it chooses to leave you i mean it's just like drinking you know uh, if you choose it and you can be proactive in your removal of yourself from that life mm -hmm. it's way kinder on the body than if the alcohol chooses when you leave you know yeah. what i mean kind of thing oh, and it's yeah. like and so the same thing fighting's the same kind of uh a, a, i wouldn't call it an addiction that can be but it's like it's like that kind of a thing it's like if it chooses when you leave that you're going to be a lot worse off for that and so it do, takes a courage to get out in time too i think do you think you got out <laughs> at the do you think for you i mean obviously it was the right choice i'd aged out anyway had you i mean will there be could there be a senior circuit that would be hilarious and and so sad. That'd be maybe the saddest circuit. They've talked about it, Have but they? I think but I think it's pathetic. Come on, come on. I mean, yeah. I don't know to watch to watch like you talking about watching Stephen Bonner, Chuck, Tito, like these guys that have already. The, the, Maybe at a what mass, point are you going to Are we going to have grandpas too sooner or later? It's like call a it a point, master's let's watch, class. Too. Let's watch the best of the best, right? And then maybe let's watch a show with those guys when they're not athletes anymore. Because to be an athlete and then to be a coach, man, that's hard. But like, what about if they're just doing that? And they like, I'd rather see somebody's passion going to something that makes sense instead of having a what becomes kind of circusy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, no, it's true. Yeah, maybe that's thinking. Maybe it's too much Barnum and, and Bailey. And then you're mailing it in. You know, right. it's like the fighter that's hungry to fight. That's a motherfucker, man. A guy that's got a hunger. Was there a guy you got but in the ring with? if you're fighting because you have to have food, mm -hmm. that's a different thing altogether. Yeah. And that's what a master, that's kind of what you're talking about. It's like, so I'm scared to go and become whatever God, the universe, whatever has me become next. And so I'm going to stay attached to my ego at this thing, which is the only thing I know. Mm. That ain't gangster. Yeah. And, when, and the crazy part is, and you throw an ego in there too, it's like, yeah, it's hard to know when you are being, when you are being resilient and staying in sure. something and being passionate. Right. And when you are beating a dead horse or when you're beating you, a dead you know, horse yeah. and no one really, it's hard to, and if a friend tells you, are they a friend? It's just, that's such a tough spot to be in. Well, and then as a fighter, if you bring up doubt, so I've infused doubt in you, what are you going to do when you're done? <gasps> If you start thinking about that too much, you're going to lose the day, man. Yeah. And you got to be present in the day to win. And so like that, that becomes a, a conversation that almost by necessity, by design, you must push off, mm. you know, which is a, a tough thing. Yeah. You got to have some tunnel vision. I mean, you almost have to have yeah. some tunnel vision in that sport. Yeah. I got to work with a, a friend of mine on a TV show, on a movie recently, uh, who's, he's, he's an active guy still, but he's been around for a, a long, long time. And, talking about that and he starts bringing it up about like maybe you know what he wants to do next and uh, i don't know he's he's uh real talented at what he does but is there five fights is there 10 fights like and what does that look like and what does it look like because now you've you've got time that you're taking away from when you start the next thing mm. of what you are right. you push that off five more years well would it afford you a lot you know so you kind of have to start doing uh, projected math in your mind about like what all this looks like and uh, his name, Demacio Page, he's got a great like record. He's got he's a fantastic athlete, but it's like 
those guys that are still viable, good, vibrant athletes like that, it's like at a certain point you go, how much more does my body take? You know, yeah. One of the guys that blows my mind still is like Diego Sanchez, still in the game. Since he was an Ultimate Fighter one man, wow. he, he won that. Like that was his right. Like and he was fighting. I don't know four years before that. Like like it, so. It's like that's a hell of a career, you know. Josh Barnett. You look at these guys that have been around for forever. There's not a lot of them. Yeah. There's not a lot of guys that have been doing it that long. Like and at that point, is it a love? Do you is it does it transform from them believing? Do you think? You know, or do you guesstimate that it transforms from them believing that they could still be the champion to them believing that this is my life and this is just what I do? I think there's a choice that guys make and they go, I'm a journeyman fighter that's going to kind of uh, be the guy like, that maybe holds the line at the top 10 or that holds the line for, you know, if a guy's on his way out. Like you're either a guy that's fighting for the top or you're just a guy that's in the space that's going to be a highlight reel for somebody on their way there, you know? Wow. And, and I, I think that that's, I mean, that's the way I saw it anyway. And, and I go, you know, at, at that point, it's like you look realistically and you go, okay, is this something that I can do? Here's guys that are the baddest motherfuckers in my gym. Yeah. Am I as good or better than those guys? And that's one question. And then the next question is, are those guys viable champions? Are they champions or are they not? And so that guy is or isn't, he's not even the champion and I'm not even close to him. What am I even doing here at the party? Yeah. You know, it's like, and that can get in your head. And so it's like all these different things. I mean, that guys behind the scenes of their skull are dealing with all the time that are, huh. and, you know, and, and so a lot of them look crazy. And why does it look crazy? Because I can't make it. I can't even have the question come up because it's such a fragile question to ask my mind. It, it, it's like somebody put a hammer and smashed ice and the, the whole psyche started to fracture then. Because of this question. So I cannot allow the question right. of, am I, yeah, I'm the fucking best, dude. And like a lot of guys, it's like people are like, and then all the fans will say, well, this, this guy's better because of this. That. No, but you're not understanding because you never fucking put nothing on the line, fanboy. Yeah. That, like he's all in, man, because that's who he must be. Right. You know, you have to be a bit deluded, a bit crazy. You know, I can't imagine. I can't. I don't know if I've ever because when I think about fighting for me, I'm not a fighter. Like oh, I, I got beat it. up a couple times. I was good at fucking laying on my back and kicking at people that were trying to punch me. You had a good ground game. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's what yeah. you're saying. I mean, I got. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I just, you know, what I was just uh, super scared. You know, I was more of a of a talker, I think. But um, so I think then fighting is like. I even have dreams, and I don't know if you've heard of this. I'll have a dream where I'm throwing a punch in a dream, and it doesn't. It stops like halfway, and it won't. My arm won't even go any further, no matter how hard I push. Like, Is it like you're throwing through a marshmallow or something that's like slow motion, like no yeah, power? Yes, no power, but like all this rage and anger I can right. feel, but my body won't let me. It's crazy. Yeah, and I don't know what that means. I just think it just means do not fight, you know? Uh, you're not good at I it. I think maybe it could mean an unexpressed energy that you're needing to get out, and the way that you can get that out and that you can train at full speed that – is at the top efficacy of the sport is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Really? And I think that that's a thing that males like need to get out to address. Like there's, there's parts of ourselves that we don't confront routinely. And yeah. I think that some of us get comfortable not confronting them, but like when we do great things happen, you know, tell Dude, me I about was, some of that, man. Let me, let me tell you this. I was at a, oh, I want to let the fans know too. I, I do for, I'd uh, like to let them forget. Know too. Sorry. You were at, uh, and I mean, but we do, if you want to get, because uh, uh, I do want to support you, uh, I want to support K-Man Coffee, we have a code. If oh, yeah, it. yeah. And I'm not trying to interrupt with an ad, but it's Theo, if you use Theo. If you use Theo at K-ManCoffee.com, um, and uh, you can see it on Instagram story on K-Man or on, on Tate Fletcher on mine. Uh, Theo is the code, and uh, I, I don't know. I'll put it on there, too. I'll put it on mine as well. But anyway, yeah, you guys can um, get a discount there. Yeah. So I just want to remind everybody. All that. And I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Uh, Where are you going to go? I'm going to make a purchase as well. I'm going to go no in there. No way. And I'm going yeah, to get Nick a new black on black shirt. 15% off. And but that's uh, cavemancoffeeco.com. Cavemancoffeeco.com. 15% off. Boom. T-H-E-O. We'll get some, and we'll, we'll keep some here in the in studio. Is it um, weird to have a longer first name than last name? <laughs> That's crazy. Or was there another thing after the Von? Did you cut it off? Oh, yeah, Seems man. Seems lopsided. I donated a lot of letters to— um, Von Felder or something, or Von Rothenstein? Or... Von Kernatowski, full last name. So you were an admiral? No, I, I wasn't. 
I was um, a Duke. I'm Polish Nicaraguan. Ah oh, shit. Yeah. I didn't know that's what. Because somebody fucked with. on a boat, pretty much. I'm guessing. Because that's not a land baby, you, you know. Know what though? That's sexy. Yeah. Re- I mean, really, you know. I mean, against yeah, all it could. Odds. You know, I think. Well, I was trying to get more back into my Latino culture and try to, you know, I'm trying to take more Spanish. Does my it, father it, taught me some when I was it young. It seems odd for a fellow looking at you the way you look, like a beautiful blonde-haired boy with green eyes and pale skin, like to talk about your Latin roots. Yeah. This falls on me eye. <laughs> yeah. Dude, well, the crazy thing is, in my town growing up, I had like, the, my brother and I had like the darkest skin around, you know, outside of black kids. And people would always call us spicks and like racial slurs all the you time. You were the closest thing to black that wasn't black. Yeah. Crazy. And people were like, you fuck, just, ra- just idiots, you know? I mean. They would call you racial names? Oh, yeah. You fucking spit. And like, what, dude? Good we God. don't even know what we are. Leave us alone. I had no idea. I was oblivious to that shit. Yeah? We had Mexican kids. They'd be the Ortegas and whatever. I just thought they were white. I was like, I have no idea. Like, growing up, it was like the, the, the same shit. Yeah, I wish we'd had more diversity. And I think now it's getting, you know, you're seeing more diversity in a lot of places, but it would have helped us out a lot growing up just for people to get, to have a better idea of what other people are like. You know, I wish we'd have had probably, we, yeah, we didn't have any... We just didn't have a lot of it. That's um, why Black Panther struck me as so important. Yeah. That it was like, it never really dawned on me until <laughs> I've been having a lot of talk with feminists and uh, oh, people like sorry. that lately. Yeah. It's been enraging and enlightening. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. They're like when you go, okay, I just want to hear like, how come maybe you think whatever. <laughs> and, and, uh, and one thing that, that I was enlightened to was the fact that any images – like if you go in the courthouse or you see statues or you look at the money we have, there's no women or people of color on any of those things. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's none. There's just white dudes. Yeah. And so if you look at all that and you're a little kid and you're not a white dude, that's got to read a certain way. And that just that, I was like, okay. And then I watched Black Panther and I go, holy fuck. Because when I grew up as a little kid, there was a great show on called Roots. Mm-hmm. And it, when I say well, great, yeah, I, I mean it was like a fucking horror movie that was a mini series that went on for like eight weeks or something. It was, and you're watching One of the people. the most watched television shows ever. Beaten. You're watching slaves' feet cut off. You're seeing the rapes in front of uh, parents and children. You're seeing this, the demoralization of a whole humanity. Like you're just watching the most atrocious events happen to black people. And if you're a black kid watching that. O.J. Simpson was in it. Was he? I had no idea. Yeah. If you're a black kid, you watch that, you go, that's available to me. That's my skin, and that's what people can do to people. Like, I never yeah. I, 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 never really dawned on me like that as a never kid. And then me. I go, okay, you're, gro- you, you're born in 2000, and you grow up and you see Black Panther. And you go, wow, some people are good, some people are bad, but like, I'm from Kings. I could be a superhero. And that's, a yeah. di- that's some different shit, man. That's a different consciousness from the gate. It's like, so we marginalize people with subliminal shit that like, and, and I just was never present to that before. And I go, Oh my God, I'm, it's like, I woke up a little bit, you know? Yeah. It's funny. You say that I've had some of that same experience recently. I was thinking about, cause when I was young, the only wealthy black people were, um, people on coming to America, the movie and people and the Dallas Cowboys. Those are the only, as far as I knew, right. you know, they had a great deal You're of like black Tony people in my Dorsett, town though. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But they had a great deal of black people in my town, but they didn't, there just wasn't the opportunity for them to have wealth, you know, it just, and I didn't realize it as much when I was a kid. I mean, you know, I thought a lot of us are poor, but I didn't, I didn't see that their opportunity wasn't exactly the same until I got older. And now I see, oh, it's like, well, yeah, if generation after generation, you know, if right. your great grandfather getting a parking ticket means you might not go to college. Right. You know, then that is not that is a very or get born because out of that traffic ticket, he maybe gets beaten to death. Yeah. Or whatever. I mean, it's like, yeah, if you're if you look at it as a kid and you go, yeah, I didn't see the difference because the opportunity we're all in the same bucket. But then when you realize I can get out of the bucket and people aren't treating me different, like it's like. Right. And, and this guy can't get out of that bucket that, that there's a, that's a barrier to entry that's not available to him. I mean, yeah, a, a black friend of mine recently, uh, this guy, Jeremy Scipio, a comedian I was working with in La Jolla. Italian. Yeah, it does sound very Italian and actually has kind of his Italian posture Suspicious, a little. Suspicious, probably Sicilian. I could see him being an Italian. Moorish. In very well done blackface, mm-hmm. actually. But um, <laughs> this guy, Jeremy Scipio, he was saying 
Well, look, let me think about it with you like this. He said, as a black man, I have to fuck with white people to make money in America. He goes, as a white man, you don't have to fuck with black people that's to true. make money. And it was just an interesting, you know, and I'm not saying that's true in every instance or, you know, I had but a it was interesting to think. Facebook that I know as a prostitute. Yeah. And she written on her Facebook, I will not work for a man ever again. I will not, as if she was reading, I won't chew gum in class, like over and over again on her Facebook post. That was it. And I thought, wow, she's really stepping out for one. And then I thought, you're, a, you're literally, your job is that you're going to, Men will pay you. Like, that's what you do. Right. Like, people are confused, Theo. That's all I'm saying. Oh, there's a ton of confusion out there. But to go back to a little bit of what you're saying, uh, what I was hearing, I, I remember I remember thinking recently when I was young, if you saw a Walt Disney, go to Disney World or Disneyland commercial, and all the people in there were white. Mm -hmm. That as a black kid, if you saw that, yep. it made me think, man, that must have been... Even if they, if even if they didn't recognize it at the time, that must have been kind of painful to watch, you know. Horrible. Or later to look back at it and be like, "Oh, Disney World!" Like I mean, they're not saying I'm not welcome, but they, it's there's probably a feeling there you would get that I'm not. Um, and that puts that puts some things in a context a little bit more for me. Also, any grocery store, yeah, or any, I mean, every everywhere, it's it's fucking different, man. And then you, but then you also have like on the grat, like I remember like they were removing a lot of the statues in New Orleans and I had gone and met at those statues, the Robert E. Lee statue with black and white kids every year for Mardi Gras and no one gave a fuck. No one ever gave a fuck. And so it's some things I'm like, you know, we can't, does it, are we going to erase our history? I what don't are we care that do? the statue's there. But let's educate everybody about what the fucking, you know, yeah. let's get hip to the skip. Maybe we put an additional plaque next to each one. Yeah. And go, here's, yeah. some, here's some other things about this also. Like, it's not all, because it ain't all gravy. Or put another statue next to it of some, you know, someone that's. We're, we're a part of the days. We're past the days where people had to be impeccable yeah. in their behaviors and all that. I mean, we've got Wiener, we got Senders sending full dick pics out to all of Twitterverse. Everybody's we've struggling. Got everybody, everybody's crazy. Everybody's, so we're able to see that people aren't, uh, infallible. Yeah, we, you know we're able to see. Yeah, fucking Bill. J he he loved a blowjob at the White House. There or like, there's all these things that we see about each other where we're able to give each other enough learning room, enough rope that if you don't go off the marks too much, you'll be able to learn. Still, you'll still be able to evolve. Like, cause we're all in this unfolding, this becoming, and then that's what I worry about. These conversations are like to control the space for that is almost dangerous because now you're censoring the natural evolution of these conversations to come out and go, let's have the full conversation. It is. So let's not undo it. It's like saying that weed's illegal or something. It's like after it's legal, it cannot be on. You cannot unknow things. Right. Right. And so we can't unknow history. And it's also routinely and historically dangerous if we do so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's wrong headed with the right, the right heart going the wrong direction, I feel like. Yeah, there's, it, we are at a really interesting time where we're calling into account where we are. I feel like we are taking a little bit of an inventory of who we are it's as a country. Yeah, You know, it's a little bit like a roll call. Yeah, And I think in some ways it's happening, you know, I even think some of, you know, like, I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff like border control and stuff like that, but it's like, we almost do need to know who's in a. Let's see who, who we are mm -hmm. so we can, you know, just so we can kind of. And go, everybody good with it? Everybody good with it? And the people that are like, no, no, dude, except for the Syrians, we're not good with it. And we go, okay, cool. We got everybody agree with him. And then we get those people away. Yeah. And we take everybody else. <laughs> I mean, it's like the thing is, is like the beauty of us is that we're all fresh. The, the beauty of 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu, like that Eddie Bravo started is that it accepts all things that have efficacy. Yeah. It's not so much into the ideology that like, hey, dude, if this works, we don't want it because it came from them or something. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, let's take all the stuff and make the best shit. Make the but best shit. That's how that's called evolution. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's, I think we're at a neat point in human evolution. I think it's scary. Look, it's tough. I mean, there are daily moments where I have to let go of some of my own thoughts and ideas and adapt some new ones. You so, know? And that goes back to the destroying the ego. For me, it goes back to like, yeah, we need to confront all these things and it's an inside job. I'm the fish I got to catch. And so how do I know that I'm doing the right things? Because I'm terrified. When I'm scared to death, I know that I'm probably on the right path. I should fucking courage up and go through that thing. Wow. You know? 
And so that's the things that I think that you go to address the ego to. How do I crush it daily? I do that shit that's scary. I do that uncomfortable thing. I do that thing that's out of the way of my comfort, you know? Dude, it's funny. I mean, yeah, I was just like, you know, I deal with like dating and like intimacy issues. I was talking, Jay Moore and I had a big conversation about this last weekend. Now, do you date like a individual girlfriend or you like to just like go I've on a dating, few different ga- dates with some different girls? I've been girls dating a girl and... for a little bit now, okay. you know? And so, but one of my big issues is when it comes to like somebody that I care about is intimacy stuff. And there's moments where it's like, I'll know that like the last, all I want to do right now is just be by myself, but I can tell somewhere inside of me that I need to not be that way. Mm-hmm. I need to like go into the thing. Because you're afraid of isolating? Well, yeah, no, because I'm afraid of not expressing some show of care or concern. Right. So, but instead of do like my brain, my the way I'm, something inside of me, my ego, whatever it is that's damaged inside of me, be like, nah, if I, you know, just turn your shoulder and just, you know, mm. make a smoothie or go in the other room or do. But then there's that part of me that's like the scariest thing for you to do right now would be to like go and like give that girl a kiss or something and just crazy? to say, you know, uh, look, you know, I know things are tough or something like that. Like something that, but it makes you fucking feel like you got to swallow vomit in your throat to say it. Yeah. And you're like, why is saying that? I know I love you and I support you so hard right now. Yes. That's like being supportive. Like that's the biggest thing almost is just even being supportive. But that thing of like, why, why is it at certain times I get my emotions so bottled up that it feels like I'm going to throw up in my own mouth to say that I care about you. Like, and it's like, that's the time to do it. I made a dude buy a dude flowers one time (laughs) because he did the wrong shit, man. And he almost beat this dude up at a, at a, at this recovery function where all these people are just fresh and trying to have a bright new life and all that. And like, and he had a pool party at his house and, and he said, you know, this dude sold, stole my mom's watch, you know, and which is shitty. Right. And yeah. so, and he, he might've grabbed him, might've slapped him, whatever, something like some public shaming around peers. And, and then it found out that his mom took the, that, that mm. wasn't a thing. And, and uh, I go, dude, you gotta make it right somehow. He goes, oh, I don't know how to do that. And I go, I feel like you need a public, it has to be public. It's gotta be in front of the same people. You gotta go to all those people. And like, and so then he did wow. another thing and he, and I said, you got to buy him flowers. You're like, I ain't buying a dude flowers. I'm like, at what point are you going to give up? At what point is this going to be the tripping thing that makes you have cancer later? Like, and, and he, and to his credit, got on board, bought him fly. But it's like that thing that you really, that's usually the thing you want to do. I was at a fucking audition, not an audition. I took one of these acting classes. Mm-hmm. I'm in an acting class. The other right. No, I know. Look, I, and we haven't gotten into a bunch of your career and stuff, you know, uh, but I well, know we that- don't need to. But I what well, the point that I like is that I got to go and I got to do this monologue for as an opener in this class. I've never done a monologue before. Wow. I've done a lot of auditions. I got that, like and so I'm there and I go, well, before I go in, I go, am I going to go first? They lock the door at two 30. So again, oh, fuck, they lock. They're serious. You know, I don't want serious. I want to hands off a little bit, a little bit laissez faire for yeah. me. Thank you. But they're not playing that way. So I go, am I going to go first and just bust a nut and get it done or what? Cause there's like eight other people that have to deliver monologue. We're going to be here four hours today. And I go, mm, and then a guy goes, oh, I'll go first. And I was like, I guess that's how he's doing it. He does a uh, Claudio from, uh, Shakespeare. Yeah. And, uh, Hamlet and, and he that was uh, a guest too. And, and he and he blows blows through it, and then I find out that he's done this twice as an employed actor in theater and plays. He's played Claudio, so he took it easy. So he knows it. I just got this thing, Sam Bick Assassins, from a week ago. I never heard of the play before. I don't know shit about this, and so that's where I'm learning it from. I was like, well, God, that guy, he really had a cheat code. Ooh, I would have. So then it. I see the rest of them. I go, I'll go last. Yeah, because maybe I'll run out of time. Maybe I won't have to go at all, because that's how my mind works. And then uh, I hear them and I go, God, they're, they're all good. Oh. They're all really good. And I go, oh, now I, I, hate go, this feeling. I go, I can't go. I like, I go, maybe I should just leave right now. I said, clearly I'm in the wrong class because these guys are really good. And I'm, I'm not even off book. I'm ashamed. Mm. Maybe, I, maybe I'll fake an injury on the way up to the stage and I'll just pull a hammy or something. I'm like, you're seated, bro. Like that not believable. Yeah. And then yeah, I, it's like, so, if so, you can't pull off a monologue, but now you're planning <laughs> to pull off a fucking. So, so then I go up and I'm, I, and it's the last thing and whatever. And I go and, and it's horrible. And it's all that terror. Oh. And the, in, anyway, the thing is, is going you out of there so after that experience mm-hmm. and all the outrageous, ridiculous things that your head contrives for you to worry about. 
You're not getting kicked out. Nobody's going to laugh at you. Everybody's here to learn. This is what you're here for. What the fuck is wrong? With, like all the thing, it doesn't make any sense. I get, but the growth afterwards of walking through the thing, like I felt myself pop in mm. my car later. I'm like, I'm different than I was. Yes. And I used to get that feeling from jujitsu and shit like But so that's the thing is I go, where's an engagement that I can get in life where I can do this continually, where I can confront myself just to be able wow. to be a normal dude that I can tolerate and not have to kill. And you find that with <laughs> jujitsu and I find that with jujitsu. I find that to with whatever that the hard thing is. I think you can do it with like, like if you go to get great, if you endeavor to be great at something, and then you get in a little bit and then you get in really deep and you see how deep the water is. And after you know enough to know that, you know, a lot and it's easy. And then, you know, a little bit more to know that you don't know shit and you're in those waters. No, that's the important water. But you got to get out over the reef to get right. into those waters. You know, you got to You got to try. You got to intend to suffer. You have to have intentional suffering mm. and then you get freedom in the rest of your life. And now when you left uh, fighting, was there was there some of that with some of your next endeavors like what was was there something you tried that didn't pan out everything dude everything's a failure in my life like i'm not a fan of any of my shit like i just i everything i just see where it could have been better different whatever and i i feel like with um wherever that goes if you start a business i don't care if you start a t-shirt company or something like whatever it is you're doing it's like there's so much to learn if it's to be a sustainable thing and now my thing is like i've got a few things popping and i'm like Okay, so you've breathed life into these things. Who are you if you're not a good steward of those things and they turn to dust? Mm. Like, you're, you're a son of a bitch, man. Like, you've got to be responsible. Like, and that's part of the thing. It's just maturing of going, I've got a responsibility to this thing I've created now, and I want to be a good steward of it. It's like the first time I got any money, man. I, I go, I... I went to find guys right away that knew how to deal with money because, oh, wow, that's because I go, I want to be a good steward of this thing. If I don't care for this energy, everybody says they care about shit. You know, I'll watch a guy and he'll be like, yeah, I care about this gym. I care about it. I care about, it. and he works for the dude that owns a gym. And I see that same dude walk by a fucking Kleenex on the floor four or five times in the afternoon. I'm like, you don't care. Care is you're taking, you're wiping the leaves off the plant, you're watering it. You're, you don't just say, I care about that plant and your hands off. Yeah. You're in it, man. I can see your care. And like, and, and that's the thing to get to with these things, I think, is to really endeavor to show that, you know, you, you're a steward of this energy. Yeah. Who cared about you, you think, most in your life, do you feel like? Cared about me? Well, my mother. Yeah? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Is your mother alive? Yeah. Yep, she lives in Santa Fe. Oh, that's a beautiful yeah. area. That's why she's the reason I cut my beard off last year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that was such a big crazy time. She was asking along for four years, and and I'd always been working, and then I never could, and then she came out, and we were gonna go to see uh, Ram Das and Jack Cornfield and all these spiritual healers mm -hmm. that she'd been admiring for a long time in Maui at this seminar. She came out here a couple days first, and then she went. Lacey took her off to. Uh, have dinner and then I went over to Logan's house and I just shaved all my beard off and then went and saw her and just the look on her face is worth all of it. But um, and why? What was that? She's just. About? I mean, she'd never seen my face and so she's right. looking at expressions and shit she hadn't seen. I never thought about it, but it is. It's like you're robbing a train and you have a bandana around your face the whole time having a beard is kind of that way. Especially that shit was just crazy on me and and so she's like looking at her little boy again. I think is maybe uh, what it was. Something like that. Like. Like a bunch of spat, yeah, because there's probably yeah things, elements, and you know, angles and stuff in her brain, and you know, and some of yeah. her best memories that she you right. didn't even realize, not purposely, but she didn't get to see, right? And then she got to see them all at once, yeah. Hey, I bet a moment like that really lets you know how much she cares. Yeah, I mean, just even almost intangibly. Well, all of it, man. I feel like a like that. That's one of the I guess big guiding things. I feel a responsibility to her too. You know, like, you know, it's like. Why not kill yourself? Cause your mom's still alive, you know? Right. It's like, it's like a really there's days in it and it gets like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I remember burying one of my best friends. He got killed by the police when we were kids and well, we weren't kids. We were, I guess in our twenties, but, um, but, and his mom and standing by his casket and looking at him and, and her mm. bawling and she squeezes my hand and she says, Tate, you got to stop, man. She says, you're not supposed to bury your kids. I'm not supposed to bury my sons, man. Hmm. And, uh, 
and it's daunting, you know, like things like that. And you go, there's a higher responsibility here, whether it's to supernatural beings or whether the beings right here, but, but it's everywhere, man. And, and, uh, I feel like I tried to shirk my responsibility as a human for a lot of years. Mm. And I felt like I didn't ask to be responsible. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be born. Thanks. And then you go, this is what is. And if I want to live any kind of a spiritual life, I have to accept what is, and then I have to be responsible with that thing. And uh, with with the energies that I create, I mean that becomes a, a calling. And I think I think even like it's like with with art or with whatever, it's like there's a responsibility. If if you're to enjoy the fruit that your art gives you, there's a responsibility for you to throw your art away routinely and mm. create new art. Mm. Otherwise, I mean, and it's like you know you're fucking 60 doing nursery rhymes or you're doing you're doing things that are like that are yesterday's news and that's what i really admire about all the comics that i see especially is that like i watched triple's deal the other week and, yeah and, and I've, i'm hearing material that i've known 10 years you know mm -hmm. that he'll never do again yeah because now it's memorialized he's been a good steward of it put a box and a bow on it tied it up it's off and now into the new things and watching rogan do that continually every year for the last 15 years i've been friends with him and just watching ari shafir do that and what it's like i get to see what success looks like when mm. i'm around other people that have a real high regard for what excellence of their craft is mm. and and i think that me surrounding myself in those circles i mean i feel privileged to be able to and then also it's what i demand it's like if if you don't have that kind of a consciousness, I, I, I probably don't fuck with you. Not that I don't love you. Yeah. But there's only so much time and, and I got to be careful of my energy and, and, and that's affected by my surroundings and by the biology around me. Yeah. No, I love this, man. I love, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I your sweater, first... I can't get over. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I just, I'm sorry. I haven't mentioned it yet and I just keep, I'm. Yeah. It's good. Dude, I chaired a meeting today in this. Really? Yeah, at Westside Pavilion, which was Wild. really, uh, and I didn't meet, I just didn't want, I, I, this is black. It's and the I, perfect I, time of the year for it. It's everything, black. dude. <laughs> everything. I just wanted something that would not contra that would contrast with these black chairs. It, it, it worked. Um, I'm going to know better next time if I get invited <laughs> back. I'm going to dress better for sure. No, please come back, man. I, I um. No, I love hearing what you're saying, man, because these are things that's so crazy that, that I just feel like I need to hear my life right now, you know, like even just personally, you know, I need to hear that, you know, about letting go and about surrounding yourself, you know, with people that you c believe can keep you in a better place and your conscience in a better place and people that you admire stuff that they do, even if it's outside of your comfortability zone, because it's, like you said, there's only so much time and it's like, man, if I if I waddle around some here with some people or some people that are bringing me down or some people that aren't are just taking from me and that don't, you know, don't that aren't not helping in a greedy way, but that aren't just meeting me halfway. I need to be, I need to be interested. Yeah. You know, is how I feel. Or about meeting it. me halfway. At least, you, you know, I go, if I only got room for these people around my life, like my picket fence, I call it right. And there's there, and it's good to have a person that's super advanced in one hand and somebody new on the other yeah. hand, right? That's a good balance to have, man. That's a conduit of strength right there that happens. But the the thing is, is for that close, close circle, if there's somebody that doesn't really contribute with with, with, with positive energies in, in whatever way that is, and they're just kind of there, I have to understand that I'm making a choice to not be as good as I could be. Because this could be a spot that somebody that's super vibrant and into this whole vibe and is a contributor could be in, which mm. would enhance it. Mm. And so am I doing everybody else in my circles a service by continuing to fuck with somebody that's like, no, nah, man, good enough good enough for me, and I'm just mailing it in. That's cool, man, but that's not an energy I can have because I want to start mailing it in. I'd like to retire into nothing and be a lazy, fat, shooting dope on the couch, motherfucker. Yeah, in the park, But bro. I cannot afford to, man. I cannot afford it. And it, it looks maybe meaner or more cutthroat than it is, but it's like my very life at stake in a way. It's like if there's not progression and it's like I'm not chasing wealth and, the, and not that I don't want all that, 
But it's like, that's not what my progression is. My progression is so I don't kill myself. My progression is so that I don't become so nihilistic that drinking a bottle of bourbon and sitting on the side of the road is just as good as driving a $100,000 car and being in a loft and being able to be inspirational and helpful to a bunch of different people all around me. Yeah. It's the same thing to me at a certain point. Right. And so if I don't have people that are fucking in, engendering my health and my vibrance towards a greater life, it's, it's not about the fucking trappings, man. It's about my soul's at stake. Yeah, it's about you. And I just got here to be a good son. The only one I got to be clear about that with is me. Right. And yeah, and I'm. Why am I protecting myself? Because my mom's still alive. Yeah. Because you have responsibilities. <laughs> but you have responsibilities. You, know? you yeah. At a certain point, you have responsibilities, and it's almost scary to think that you do if you think about some of your emotional responsibilities, yeah. um, or if you take them on like that. Yeah. You know, to be a son, to be a brother, even to be a friend. I was talking to a friend earlier. Yeah, to be a friend. And I was like. You know, you get hypoglycemic, you turn into uh, a not as nice person, and all the time it's like people have to remind you, well, have you eaten today? And it's like if you're not doing the basic shit to take care of yourself, I just can't fuck with you, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're at such different place. If we're troubleshooting to get better all the time and you're troubleshooting like at mu- how to step around a mud puddle still – Good luck, man, but you need to be around other mud puddle steppers. Right. You know what I mean? I'm over here trying to do some consciousness shifting shit. Right. Yeah. And, and that and that's just how it is, man. And it's like not everybody can help everybody. You know, some people are too far down the road to be able to do this or that or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I know it's something I need to be careful of. I don't have it all worked out yet. I've been writing it. I'm yeah. trying to write a book. Theo. Oh, I could see that. I love listening to you, man, but, and, I would uh, re- and I would read you. But I think what you said a second ago is having somebody who you, th- uh, you see as – like a lighthouse in one hand, and somebody you see as somebody you can help in I some need to way. Be of service. Yes, in another. Yeah. Because then that chain of that chain of hands goes further down, and so then somebody's holding on to the mud puddle step. Right. Exactly. It's just maybe you're not in that part of the chain. That's at this a good moment. way to look at it. Yep. Um, yeah. No, man, I, I, I love. Uh, it's not my most. Re- it's not that I'm uh, uh, swaging myself a responsibility here, right. but. That can happen with a trickle, like if, as long as I'm looking to advance here. Like if I if I don't look to make me the best representation of Tate Fletcher that I can be walking through the world today, yeah. Then anybody I would help is diminished. Also, it's like that. It becomes like that yeah. in a way. You know, your highest good has to be to you. Yeah. No. I, I and love- why is that? So I can be useful to others. Like yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, I, you said the word conduit a little bit ago, and I think more and more like that. The more I take care of myself, the more I find that I can be a conduit from some higher power or something to do things that help others that make me then feel good. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, and I, and I like purposeful. Yes. Right. Yeah. Not, I can try not to even good. Go out of it. But yeah. like, but useful, right. like, like, fuck, I, you know, it's like, I remember the first time a dude remembered my name from yeah. like, like a lot of people are like, I don't know how I could be helpful, this or that. And I, I was a new into LA and, uh, yeah, man, this I, I, got me tearing up a little bit. I just, yeah, man, I think so much about how much being purposeful is just, it's becoming, I think, the thing. It, you know? It's it. Listen, like, where the where this guy's helpful to me, I came back the next week to the same place, and the dude's like, Tate, how are you doing? He's got no fucking reason to remember my name. Yeah. But it, I mattered, and it was the first time I go, I mattered. Like it felt, and you can make somebody feel like they matter if you just fucking get out of yourself enough to remember their fucking name till the next time you see them. Yeah. And it's like, it becomes that thing. And I, I, this friend that, you know, there's a lot of people in America. It's weird because we have more tents than ever. I've never seen, I don't know if tents just became popular. If people are just really calling it camping instead of homelessness. Yeah. But like right on sunset, like in downtown areas where we never had it before on Beverly Boulevard. And La Cienega, yeah. there's tents set up last night. And I was like, this is a fucking, this is crazy, you know? And and with all that going on in America, and we got a, a president that's saying we're winning like crazy. And, and people in the middle are like, life's always hard here. It's always kind of been sucky. And it still is. It's you know, There's no people with tents there because people don't want to live in Indiana or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. And, and so they don't feel that. But it's like, here on the fringes, man, we're falling apart a little bit. And, 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 but the bottom line is regardless is I've got a friend that's got what I would call the disease of affluence. And, and what happens is I used to work in these nightclubs and I'd see all these really rich kids and they grow up with no consequences and, and it's dangerous, man. And it, and it looks shitty to all of us viewing it, but really 
with any empathy, it's worse for them. For and them. they start to believe all kinds of lies and, and things that when that veil is removed from them, that safety nut, holy, it's, that's a, a dark, dark area. But with that, I have a friend that is like, grew up in a real advantageous, uh, environment, arena, yeah. you know, and, and is like really delving into spirituality and trying to, uh, figure out herself and all that kind of stuff and feels ashamed of it mm. because doesn't have the same concerns about having to find a career or this or that or whatever that a lot of people do or is, and isn't drawn to like having a baby and whatever, all the thing that people do to avoid themselves. Right. Yeah. Like, no, now my purpose is my kid. Cause I was too scared to confront my own life and I don't know how to live it. So I shit out a kid and I'm going to show them how to not do shit too. Yeah. Uh, so she's making some real courageous choices is my point. But like, what does Oprah do? What, what does Leonard Cohen do? What does everybody do as soon as they get papered up, man, they try to find God. They try to make sense of it all with spirituality. Like everybody looks towards those common universal vibrations that echo through all of our hearts and souls and connect us all. That's, we're trying to curate that vibe of the universe, man. That's what everybody tries to do. And so at whatever point you're trying to do that, that's that's the right end game, I think. Yeah. And so when you say it's turning more into this conscious, I'm like, I, I feel like that that's that's the right place for us to go. Yeah. And there will be a schism. There will be a divide, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we're on a lot of elements here where we're, I think there's a lot of things where, I didn't think it for a little bit, but now the more I find myself being around that kind of stuff, the more I start to believe that that is the mm. truth, which is interesting too. You speak it in. I mean, you can, you speak the truth into existence, you know? And I see it. I mean, the more I be, put myself in environments where I see people being helpful to other people and stuff like that, mm -hmm. the more I start to believe that that's the answer that I never really saw for some reason before, you know, when all you really got to do is sit with somebody that you really helped that you've impacted and the feeling that overwhelms me is that there's, there's never such a resounding feeling that I'm in correct placement in the universe, right in the palm of the hand of God at that very moment. And I'm comforted in a way that I never am when I'm deep into service like that. Yeah. Like, there's nothing that is like that. There, there just isn't. And we look for it a lot of other places that aren't the place. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's Easter egg hunt, man. That, <laughs> that chocolate rabbit's in our hearts, dude. You know? Um, yeah, we're, I want to talk about the fight. Uh, okay. But real quick, I want to talk about just you talked about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Do you jiu only go a certain time on your podcast? No. We can go however long. But I know. What, I what's your general time frame? An, an hour, hour two half. hours? Hour and a half? Yeah. I don't even know how long we've been talking. An hour? An hour probably. Been about an hour, and yeah, usually about 90 minutes, seems like. Cool. Yeah. But. You're only the second guest we've ever had. No way. Yeah. Really? So we had Jay Moore last week, and then you. Cool. Yeah. We just got into the new studio, and um, so it's been awesome, man. And Nick has been so helpful. And, it's uh, dope. And Chris Perez has been so helpful. He's not here. Nick has to train him so we can have... Um, I was wondering, because it's interesting to have like just like a... Uh, I really like just conversational podcasts, and then like the way like Shab does his, where he's very uh regimented and and pretty rigid and like like he's making a real show like a finely designed right. show you know which i'm like you're like an adult you know like, yeah. like but he's like the most adult out of anybody that i've seen going like and, and everybody's funny. got these different tacks that they're taking and some people are like, no we got to keep it under underneath an hour because attention spans and then i was on rogan once and we only went for an hour because we both had to blast and that's the only thing people complain about that it's only an hour and i'm like there's no rules here yeah a, that, so it's just interesting to see all the choices that we all make inside the space, you know? Yeah, I think we're still learning, you know? I think, um, yeah, we're still learning. Like, I was so nervous to put out the interview with Jay Moore. Um, no, why? I think just, I don't know. I just get nervous about, I guess part of it is that I, a lack of some parts of self-confidence and then that I don't want to, something always about me that I don't want to waste people's time. Yeah, I hear that. There's this I, big I thing, that. and I've always felt that in yeah. a weird way. I don't want to waste people's time. Like, I get that. Because I don't know if maybe I always felt growing up that, like, um, man, it's crazy. I never even thought about this before, but that somehow that I was a waste of um, that I was a waste of people's time. Maybe somewhere I got this weird thing inside of me that made me feel like I was a waste of, of, uh, of people's time. Maybe I didn't get enough attention or something, and so then I felt that way. Mm -hmm. That's how I, you know, I was like, oh, well, if I'm not getting the attention I need, it's because – 
I'm a waste of time. Right. You know, you're maybe an, I never really thought about that. You're an encumbrance on, on your people or something or like a, another task that they have to yes. take care of. Yeah. Yeah. So I never even really turned it like that a little bit. Um, but I want to know how can Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, <laughs> help a guy help? A, what ways can we see that something like that um, can help people it, it, outside of the physical element, ways that they never thought of? Like what are other things you kind of touched on it a little bit ago? I think a lot of it can happen with almost anything. It's like it's like coming here. It's like to go to what you're saying. It's like I'm nervous coming here to be on a podcast with you, which is in essence, I'm nervous to come and have a conversation with my friend that I really admire. Like how weird is that? That doesn't come up. Why is your ego talking to you that way, Tate? Right. You know, but then I come and I show up and then I, and then whatever happens happens. And then I go, well, I'm not nervous now about putting it out. Cause fuck it. I feel like a jackass anyway. Might as well just expose it, put it out. It is what it is. And I just go and I throw it all away after it. But it's always before for me that it's bothersome. But it's like that way to drive to a gym, to an acting class, to a jujitsu class, to a wherever you're going, whatever it is you're undertaking that is a, takes some modicum of discipline. Mm-hmm. If you're Weight Watchers meeting, whatever it is. If you go there, regardless of how you feel about it, it's better almost if you feel like I, there's no way I can go. I don't have time. I hate this. That's even better. And you go anyway. Mm-hmm. If you just it, it, so part of it was like training contrary action. I would go anyway, and then I avail myself to the process, and then I walk out a different man. And it happens every single every time. single time. And so and that's just what happens with the gross construct of going in, coming out, right? Of that's anything. just that, right? Mm-hmm. And then in jujitsu, man, I get to problem solve life. I get to forecast life. I get to look down the road. I get to troubleshoot what um, mal intents are going on. I get to I get to create subterfuge if I want. I get to manipulate a little bit, and all in a language that only you and I are speaking to each other, and nobody else is really listening. And even people that are watching that could that could listen that know the language. They're not seeing everything because there's so much pressure and counter pressure and, and different points that are that they can't know that either. That only you and I that are community. And it's like, so you're having these convers it's a fucking conversation that's going on. Jiu-Jitsu teaches you a language with which to troubleshoot. Sh- and then after you and I are finished, regardless of the outcome, we go to help each other to clean up our shit so that we'll both have a harder time with each other next time. It really doesn't make sense if you're looking at a competition-based lifestyle. Mm. But what Darwin wrote about in Origin of Species was not competition solely. His intent was to talk about how we are born of co- cooperation. And, and, and through when we butt up against each other, we cooperate ourselves into a tighter knit, better, more efficient version than we were previously. Wow. So tribal. You know, and, and that's what happens in jiu-jitsu all the time. And the thing is, is if I don't, if I just want to get, if I just want to be the best, if I want to, you know, solve my ego, then I just keep killing you. Same triangle choke every time I kill you with the same thing. You're like, this guy's got a great triangle. It's like, nope, you just suck and don't know my trick. Right. And I get to stay there forever as the boss. But if I show you my setups and I go, hey, here's what's happening, dude. And when I do, don't let me do this, dude. You let me do this every time. Don't let me do this. And I teach you how to avoid my triangle. Now we both get exponentially better. Yeah. The other way robs you and it robs me. Because I'm not going to grow. And I'm not going to grow. But now that you're growing, I have to find another way. I have now to I have to get graded. I'm already great at the one thing. Now I got to get graded at another thing. Now I have to find other roads. Now we're both in this place of exponential growth. When we share, when we open source it, and that's the only place I've seen that happening. I mean, Elon Musk takes that shit from jujitsu rooms. That's what we're doing in jujitsu. We're problem solving and we're helping others to get to a place of evolution at a much faster rate than we ever could. Mm. And and that becomes only when you're when the when the ego goes away. Yeah. And yeah, ego comes up, gets confronted, gets smashed. All that stuff happens in there, but it's a healthy playground for it. You know, yes. and, and, and it helps in all the ways, you know, I, I've, I've, uh, I've got a daughter that's 21 years old and wow. she is, uh, I didn't know that. she was adopted when she was three and 
I didn't see her again until she was 12. And then when she's 17, she reached out again. They, there was whatever, a lot of stuff. And we, we talk all the time now. And we see each other now and again. And But to tell her something and say, hey, man, when you're fucking with these dudes, by the time you're 27, here's what happens. She can't believe that because she doesn't know jujitsu. Right. She'd have to trust a dude that ain't been in her life. Ever. Like, But I can go easily with you and say, hey, you know, when you behave this way, it allowed me to take your back. And that's why I strangled you. Shit, that happens in two or three minutes. Like you can completely unwind and go, oh, yeah, if I'd have thrown a wizard in there, that would have happened. And so and you can overlay the microcosm of jujitsu with the macrocosm of your whole life. So if, if I can go, dude, if you keep fucking with this company or with this thing or whatever, in 10 years, this is where that goes. Right. You wow. see. And, and, and you start to believe you start to see systems. And so it started to overlay systems and positions in life when, you know, like a lot of guys that are black belts in jujitsu, they got great technique and this and that, but that's not what being a black belt really is, man. If you can't overlay that shit into your whole life, you're fucking, you're missing the point, man. Yeah. You know, and that, and there's, there's a whole, there's, there's levels to this shit, you know, as they say. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I learned it even just in, you know, going to some 12 step stuff that I start to little things that they are pop into my life. And that's where it helps me even the most. It's everywhere. It's just learning like a different little bit of how to adjust the template that I had. I think it's like getting in touch with universal truths. Yeah. And then believing them and going, I'm going to use the technique now, you know? Yeah. And instead of going, no, the technique's wrong. It's like, man, if I've seen that, it's like if you're if you're not good at a triangle, but you've seen a bunch of other guys be able to kill really good guys with it, you you go, okay, maybe you know you don't be a real asshole, crazy, just deranged by your own ego. If you go, triangles don't work. Yeah. It's like no, at a per certain point, you have to admit you suck, you're deficient, you don't have <laughs> skills, you're not, you're bad at this, you haven't done any of the work, you're lazy. <laughs> You have to, and once you can, but if you just say triangles don't work, you ne- you just walk through that guy for life. And we all know them. Sometimes they're 80 oh, years yeah. old. They just get old. But if you're able to go and have that land on you, go, it's my responsibility to make the triangle work. Well, now we have a place where we can learn. And that's what humility is, right? Being teachable. Yeah. And so I, tr- you know, I'm like, how do I always break myself back into that? You know. Does, so a, a lot of humility can be learned through those I think it's all that, you know, you're going to go, I want get, humility so go much. get di- dominated in the most primal way possible by a girl or something just yeah. because you don't know. Te- like, there's not much more that like is a humbling aspect to a guy where you got to go. I don't know anything. I avail myself to the process to learn or else you go, that's gay. I'm out of here. You know, it's like you're one or two guys. you like when confronted with that, you're one or, or the other. I've been the second guy uh, a lot of points in my life, and I, I certainly don't want to be that guy anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know? and once you get ashamed of being the second guy long enough, you go, okay, I'm not going to do that shit anymore. Because I lose eventually. By yeah. just saying, by just by just having the judgment, in, it serves me for a while. But it gets, it, We get afraid to lose, and then we really lose. If we're afraid to lose, but we go ahead and endeavor to lose anyway, then we win. It's a weird thing. It's like those paradoxes of life. And you got to have a mind that goes and goes, oh, yeah, this is completely true. This is opposite of that. And it's also completely true in the same space at the same time. Yeah. It's like and when you start to look at life like that, you go, "Okay, it's my responsibility. Everything is my responsibility. The relationships aren't 50 50. There's nothing. It's all 100 percent my responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know that it it all lands on me if I want to get better. And the choice is, do I want to grow? Or is stagnation okay with me? Right. You know? And sometimes if you choose stagnation, yeah. is okay with you? That's okay, too. I've had Might months okay on the for couch. You. Yeah. Also, where it's like that, and until that grading, it's just the consequence for me is higher. If I let it go long enough where that grading in my heart, where I say, you dude, you can be better. You mm-hmm. could try harder. Mm-hmm. You could be, you need to start. If I let that go too long, I'll destruct. Yeah. And so I've, I've got to pay. I just have to be sensitive to that for me because there's high consequences if I... Um, if you don't mind, if I employed, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like there's a price to pay that I'm not willing to accept the cost for. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the fight a little bit, man. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, for you know, just having a conversation. Huh. This is cool. It's been a fun cool. conversation. I love it. Yeah. Thanks, man. It's been really cool. Um, yeah, I want to talk. Well, I'm so- a Tony fan. Oh, you and, are. And, uh, and I, I, how do you feel about I, that? I, uh, I, you know, watched his whole career and. And really love and admire him, and I'm. Uh, I, he's a champion, to like he's a champ, man. And and if anybody is gonna meet beat um, 
that Russian song bitch. It's him, I yeah. think. So then I look at, at Brian Ortega, who is also game to fight him. And then I look about the 145 champ coming up to fight. And and that's a bad motherfucker, too. Like, you know, I don't ever want to count that guy out. He's a lot like Diego back in the day, you know, is is how um, how he lands on me. But but the ground and pound, you know, the last time we saw Nurma get out of fall, he fought with such ferocity that and he's fighting a, a, a real G like I didn't like I was like, you're not going to grind anybody out at this level because yeah. they were talking about that in the pre-show. They're not. He's, you know, he grinds them out and he's going to wear them out. I'm like, not at this level, like with lesser guys, even in that, even in the UFC at that weight level, but like not at the top 10 level guys, you're yeah. not going to, you're not going to grind somebody out and make them quit and take their heart. Right. And then you watch him do it. And I was like, that is a vicious controlling ground and pound of a guy that's just better at those points of control. And then, you know, cause it's two things to be able to control like that on the ground mm-hmm. and keep a man from having his hips get up. And also then that's one thing, which isn't hard to do, but the, to create an assault, to be able to take one of your limbs to start smashing that same guy while you're controlling him. That's, that's baffling. That's an art, man. That's hard. And you've got to be, so much better than the guy that you're beating, or he has to be clipped, which he's not. That's not a guy that's shaken because you were devastating on the ground and hit him with a shot. It's because you took him down and you're so much better at controlling that you can actually control and free up a limb enough to create horrific, furious, nightmarish damage on another God. body. And, and that's at the top level of the game. It's going to be an exciting fight. Is it going to be an exciting fight? I mean, I think it'll be like that. It'll be because you're going to see guys that are so resilient, so tough that have really like nothing to lose. Like you've got to fucking go in and just savage it out and guys set themselves free. When you watch guys flail like that, that's a beautiful thing, man. When they go out and they're like, no game plan, going to go out, let my training take over. And they just, and if they can put that stuff into, into effect, I think that's a, that's a tremendous fight to watch. But I, I think that eventually what happens, I mean, because He's not good on his feet, right? He's not not the best on his feet. Who so, are you talking about? Khabib? Never get off. Yeah, Khabib oh, yeah. is not. And and so and I'm I don't know a ton about fighting, but I've just gotten into it. Yeah. But I'm super curious about how like you know a guy dropping you know coming in at the last minute, you know what chance is that? Is that is there any advantage to that? I mean, it's a different. You know, the thing is about fighting that it really rings true is it's a different guy on it every day. I've seen guys that wear belts that are going, I hope I trip when I fall out, when I walk out and I trip up the stairs and knock myself out and I don't have to fight. These are savage motherfuckers that everybody loves. Just because one day wasn't their day. And it's of. just not, it's your, your head's not in the same spot every time you walk out. And, and so, you know, who, who shows up on fight day? Some guys say, you know, Dana says that a lot. We'll see who shows up on fight day. And it's like, it's really, I mean, there's so many different, factors that go like girlfriends diet weight cut like there's everything that goes into it. just where your head are are you feeling like 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 are you reliving some kind of child like it's like there's everything that goes into it it's a head fuck yeah. i know guys that have fucking gone they've already fought guys and then started dating that guy's girlfriend and then sends them pictures while they're getting their hands wrapped in the, like there's all kinds of stuff that goes on. You That's know what I mean? Arts. There's the dark arts, bro. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Nick, you have a, qu- a good question? Uh, going back to Tony Ferguson and our discussion about sunglasses inside, uh, his injury happened. He gets a pass all the time. He was he was doing some press uh, and he tripped over cords while wearing his prescription indoor sunglasses. So people were speculating if that had anything to do with his injury. If his sunglasses did? Yeah, if he would have had those Run off. Run a crazy conspiracy theory? Yeah. He's at Fox Studios, right? Yeah. When he tripped, mm-hmm. right? He did have his sunglasses on, I just found out, indoors, which maybe he had a compression shirt on too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> However, you're in Fox Studios and you're one of the most savage athletes. Like People wouldn't think that it was crazy if they saw you just fucking running through a jungle and swinging vine to vine and grabbing a bamboo and ripping its throat out and just going on. like you're that kind of animal. Yeah. Right. And in training stuff happens, guys blow their knees out. There's guys, I mean, you know, I've been in 
where everybody's wrestling, we're doing shoot boxing or something, and somebody shoots, and then another couple goes into him. That guy's got a fight, but now his knee's blown out. Like, like I've seen a lot of horrible accidents happen at the wrong time, all that. But you're in a TV studio, and then you've hurt yourself tripping on a cord where it blows your knee out to that effect. Did that happen? Or is there an overlord that's going, you know what? You move away from this one. We're going to put him here. And then you're going to. I don't know what goes on behind the scenes there. Right. That all is black magic to me. Do you like mean like there, an overlord? There could be something like, hey, here's an envelope, Tony. Right. Your knees hurt right now. Okay. As you leave the UFC presser at Fox Studios where it's a completely controlled environment and you're not doing any fitness at all. And so your knees hurt. Here's your envelope. And then just we're going to take care of you, but it's going to be three fights from now. Wow. Or so I don't know. I like that theory because Max Holloway, who is stepping into face Khabib on six days notice, he was scheduled on UFC 222 in early uh, March to fight Frankie Edgar, and he dropped out with an injury. Now it's Khabib versus uh, Max Holloway, and either winner sets up that mega fight with Connor that's off in the distance. So I really like that theory. I don't know. It just dawned on me yesterday. I was like, this strikes me as a little. I haven't talked kind of I don't cord? know anything. And I don't think that any of these people are dishonest or anything. Right. This is entertainment. That's yeah, this not is entertainment. what I'm saying. These are all men of honor for sure. Oh. And I hope that the best thing is happening for everybody. But that just dawned on me as a little funny. I thought, well, maybe something is afoot. You know? Has Do you feel like um, the UFC and um, the different organizations have turned a little bit more into like a WWES? I mean, they're just looking where the money is. And I think right. what the beautiful thing about that is, is that you see that actual real fights garner big money. And also, I think that uh, we as athletes... Uh, I, you know, add myself in that very loosely but like if you're yeah, an active no, you if you're an active time. athlete that is that is uh taking a paycheck from the ufc in particular right now i think what we're seeing is how much actual money uh the ufc and these fight organizations are making i mean when they can talk about the idea that they're going to come off of a half a billion dollars for an mma fight purse for a single bout i mean when historically under 2 million pays every fighter on a card of 20 fights wow. or something. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, so like how much money was actually all, always in the cut really? Like, cause boxing's blowing it out like this, like, and they don't have the viewership that we do. What's going on for real though. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that all that stuff there, we're coming into a leveling, uh, where, you know, guys, guys are going to be able to help more than ever. And I, and I'm not one of these guys that's got sour grapes about, they're so cheap and this and that. Or I, I'm not that guy at all. I'm just saying, like, it, it just gets more fair. People, they, they built they built the platform that everybody's standing on, man. Like, fucking honor that. Respect your shit, guy. Yeah. Damn it. Respect where respect what was available because these men, uh, Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta and Dana White, put themselves on the line uh, with big dollars to be able to make a platform like this that built made our sport, man. They, 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 they did that, you know, yeah. uh, Bellator didn't do that. Uh, King of the cage didn't do that. Probably didn't none of these, you know, they did that. And, and so, uh, for a bunch of us that were going to be, you know, shipping clerks or fucking janitors or, uh, you know, school teachers or dancers, what, even. What, what, lawyers or dancers, maybe, you know, who knows what happens, take a turn at the circus. Um, to be able to go and get an exposure like that for doing a thing that I was doing for free, you know, that guys that everybody that was a fighter that had that heart, that was something that we had to find out about ourselves. It wasn't about a job. It was, it was a passion, man. It was a real passion. And so I think that like, I just give thanks to that wherever it is. I never want to sound like I'm, uh, disloyal or feel like there's no, sour grapes or anything seem like that. about that. I got nothing but admiration for that whole group. And, and I, cause and I say that because, you know, they've paid poorly for a long time. They paid two grand and two grand and, but you know, there's a building thing and they got to create solvency in your business. So anyway, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure after you've probably learned a lot about uh, business after you got sure. into business. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of see it, able to see things from different side, which I'm sure has been, um, really interesting. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I guess, yeah, it's like, I can't imagine what that's like to be in at certain levels of things and then to have it 
I'm sure it's kind of like the same with like guys like Dusty Rhodes or something. Not to put you know you in any wild age bracket or anything, but you know Ric Flair's or Dusty Rhodes or the big boss. I mean, you look at like wrestlers that I watched yeah. growing up who weren't getting paid top like you know probably what the they there's deserved. only probably a couple that really like Hulk Hogan of that era, maybe the Iron Sheik or yeah. something. Like there's only a few guys that probably really got. Really got money, up. yeah. But even before that, like Kerry Von Eric, like those guys, you know. And then you look now, and these guys are, it's a lot more polished. They're not even fighting as hard. It's a little <laughs> bit different, you know. Do you think the fighting has always been as hard? Or do you think it's harder than ever? In, in wrestling or in no, the UFC? No, in UFC, sorry. <laughs> in wrestling, it's probably always been about the same. And uh, and uh, in the UFC is hard, um, yes. It's always been a pinnacle level event. And... That looks different from year to year because there's eras to this shit, right? And so a guy that's solvent and, and a top 10 guy 10 years ago is not going to be even a very good amateur today, right? right? Kind of thing. And and so like you, you look at the, the level of exponential growth and evolution of the athlete, of the abilities and athletic abilities of the athlete, where we're getting athletes from also. Now you've got a, a real viable income base where – if I'm a real motherfucker as an athlete, like LeBron James, yeah, and I'm walking onto a a, a D1 basketball uh, group or, or football or something like that, and I can do that, and I can go towards that, and I could maybe maybe I can get picked up for a few years enough to maybe get a pension in the NFL or something. Like now, you 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 go and you look at that, whatever that is. I don't know. They pay those guys every year, or you go. I could go and I could actually become a superstar. Why? Because you know what I mean. I'm 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 fast. I'm strong, and I'm able to learn. Or all those old high level wrestlers. Now, if you're a wrestler, if you're a kid, and you're one of these D level wrestlers, like if if you were a D one wrestler and you went into uh, the Olympics or or the World Games or in, anything, that's the end, man. Yeah. And now you go in and you're that good. You don't even have to be that good. But if you're that good and you have a ferocious heart and mind that is able to now learn how to dance on your toes instead mm -hmm. of being flat footed or <laughs> like all that kind of thing, man, you're, you're the savage. And now there's a real place for you in actual paid sports. Yeah. And so I think the level of athlete, we're aggregating better athletes as opposed to uh, dudes that just came off and had a, had a willingness to express themselves that way. Yeah. And I think that that's what's happening. And now, there used to be athletes that would just really party really hard and only be in shape for certain times. And then as, as we're aging, like uh, Randy Couture said a great thing about it where he had said, you know, I don't get in shape for fights because they asked him how long are you going to take to get in shape for this? He says, I don't, I have to stay in shape at my age. Mm -hmm. The only difference between me uh, as a 45 year old and a 25 year old that I'm going to fight is that he can get in shape in a couple of months for a fight. I have to stay in shape because the getting in shape, it's too much of a process. Like there's no skill. Right. Uh, it's easier to maintain it. Right. And yeah. so I have to maintain it if I want my skills to get higher. Mm. And most fighters then used to do that too. And I had a, uh, you know, a talk with Michelle Watterson a while ago. She'd fucking come off a win. And, and, but then it's like, you know, I said, you know, we get in these positions where there's these guys and they, they get into great shape and then they, they fall and they have pizza afterwards for fucking three months mm -hmm. and with that is a uh that's a way to behave because you get depressed after you fight no matter what and it comes down and then you have some freedom and you take all the tight controls off but like imagine if you just mitigated the time when you went into the hole and you let your weight go to control and you didn't have to get in shape again because the next time that phone call comes and you have to start getting in shape well if you got two months You'll spend a few weeks getting into shape, right. dialing your weight in. You'll be worried about other shit. What if you took those worries away because you knew that just by just starting to do two a days again, your weight would come down naturally and because you never went so crazy with it. Your cardio never got out of shape because you always paid attention to it because your lifestyle was it's your fucking job to be a fighter now. This is what you do. Right, it's this different. is your mechanism. Are you not going to keep it oiled and polished all the time? Because if you're not, the difference between you and a champion is... Is it is, they are. You're never going to get there. You'll be the person they step over. Mm -hmm. Because the champion nowadays cannot be the guy that's taking that time off. To do cocaine and, or to do maybe, this or that. And, unless, yeah. unless, I mean, there's there's outliers, but there's the John Jones. I think that John is is able to come in at, at whatever. Like for, those for Lawrence now, Taylor. He's, he's, yeah. still, he's still able to. But it's like that. you're going to point to one anomaly. Right. The aggregate of the guys, 
of the people of the athletes. You're going to have to maintain that, and that and that's where it's going. So it's getting to be where. You know, you just can't catch up. Where the median level is so high. It's so high. Um, yeah, and I even notice I have a comedy. Like, a lot of the best comedians now are sober. Right. You know, or don't drink or never got into it. Right. Whereas it used to be a tool that people would use to probably get more creative and wild on stage. For a while now, it's becoming less that. And they use it for an excuse. Right. Oh, I was so stoned on stage, or I was so drunk, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I've had too many drinks, or yeah. You know, it's like people use that as their gimmick. You know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna see the kind of drunk guy up there again, and he'll have his cocktail, and 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 it's like that's that's a gimmick. I mean, and it's like, right. and That's good comedy in a way, but it's like there's other comedy that I appreciate more, you know, than that. Right. And do you are you creating the best environment for, you know, for to the best you to grow in? Yeah. Yeah. You can't discipline yourself if you're gonna get loose a lot. Um, going back real quick to the fight, uh, do you think that that's happened before ever that they, that there's been like fights, uh, fights that have been paid to be pushed certain ways? hundred percent. Yeah. Why is that happening now? I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking about the environment, you know, I believe it has happened already. I believe it's happened at least twice. Which fights? The only one I'll say that I believe that it's happened at least once is that. There was a time when Pride got bought by the UFC, and Pride was a big Japanese fight organization. Pride, the premier, known as the most savage fighters in the world. Like, if you were to say on a gradient who was more talented, UFC fighters or Pride fighters, and there wasn't a lot of crossover for some time, you would say the Pride fighters are the best in the world. UFC is a strong second. And the UFC bought them. There was some crossover for a while, but eventually the Yakuza, I think, it just disbanded. You know, it was a it was a done deal at a certain point. And the UFC owned all the contracts from all the Pride Fighters. So they would get guys, they got the Nogueras that way. Uh, they probably owned Bob Sapp. They uh, got Heath Herring, um, a bunch of dudes, right? So then there was a fight, and Heath Herring fought. Uh, Noguera, I believe is what it was. And it was, I think it was up in San Jose, maybe. And anyway, uh, you watch the fight happen. And inside, in, it might have been in the first round. And Nog laid in with a couple of shots and, and knocked down Heath. And then maybe Heath knocked him down and got scared, I think, that he was going to knock him out. And he didn't throw another punch the whole round. Mm. Like, he didn't go to finish him. And I was thought, that's super odd for a fighter. He didn't throw a strike the whole second round. And then he, I'm like, I feel like Heath Herring bet against himself and threw a fight just now against Nog. It's, it's like, that's, it's like it seemed like as a viewer, that's what I was watching. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, like that, Yeah, look, that's that, a that's vibe the you get and as a then, viewer. Then, then there's guys in a camp that I, that, there was that talk about but you know that stuff sneaks in i think what's more prevalent probably is is judges you know because if you like like if you were to pay like a nick diaz and mcgregor if you're gonna pay either one of those guys to do something in a fight like whatever it is they've got such a game competitiveness a savagery in that intention of destruction of their opponent that even if they agreed to all that when they got in that precise moment when and and when there's a fin when you can finish it when you can alter it all right they're gonna take that because they're trigger pullers man those guys and so like you can't pay that guy right to you can't count on him but you can count on the judge yeah and the judge will do what you say every time and so you just tell the judge and fucking you know that's a much safer way to that's go. what i figure i figure those guys just get a check for an envelope here's a hundred grand and it's gonna go like this and I, 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 cause you could guarantee that yeah. you can't, those gar the fighters are, well, that's a wild card to try to convince a fighter to do a thing. Well, <laughs> you know, it's coming from a man who's been there. What about a uh, thug roses? You have another shot. Oh yeah, baby. That's my girl. I Is love it? her. She's maybe my favorite consciousness in the whole UFC, man. Mm. She's something beautiful. That one. Yeah. I, I think that I really, I really admire the way she carries herself. Um, Regardless, through through her whole career, through victories, defeats, all of that, you know, uh, I love that you know she's like one of the most physically beautiful people walking the earth, really. And then, and she saw that, and she's like, I don't want to be like. There's a handful of other girls that are really, you know, part of their thing is that they're the beautiful girls in the UFC. You know, mm -hmm. like 
there's there's a couple of those like that they're, they're really gorgeous not that everybody's not beautiful blah 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 uh and she she just shaves her head she's like i'm not i'm not gonna play this game you know and I, i'm gonna play a different game because the reasons i'm here are different mm. than for attention and fame you know and, and i think that there's something i mean i really i admire the heck out of her and the way she, just the way she carries herself she's such an inspiration and such a a mark of dignity and somebody that by the way they're walking here's what it is by the way that she walks and behaves i know that she's sacrificing money and fame hmm. i know that she is i know that it's a calculatable metric of how much she's losing by behaving the way she does it's and she does esteemable. and she fucking does it anyway wow you know it's, it's very like that, that's how i feel about her yeah, yeah, so you don't and so see as that. far as her i'm a I, i'm a i'm a real fan in that like and I think she can do anything. And I think that that's, that's a woman that has got success uh, ingrained in her in a way that whether the fight, you know, we're watching life happen on screen or, or wherever, whether it's uh, movies or fights or whatever we're seeing, what, public figures, you know, guys that are commentating, like all of that, we're watching this shit happen live. Um, and you might be watching all losses. Mm. And it's all overlaying the next win, which will also be a loss too when overlaid over the next. It's like we're playing this game of hopscotch of like, I'm going to try my best knowing that this is all just practice for tomorrow. Mm. No matter what it is, if it's the Super Bowl today, this is an opportunity I could get better right now today for the next thing. Also, I can't think about the next thing ever. It's that paradox you got to live in. I got to have it all into this fight right now. This is the only thing I can think about. And also, this doesn't mean anything. All this is is a next step into my tomorrow. Mm. You know, so it means everything and it doesn't mean anything all at the same time. And like and when you start to live in those paradoxes, you go, I've got to have a higher faith in the universe. Yeah, because something know? else is going on out here. And There's so does the fame matter? To. Does the money matter? Does No, none of that matters. It's how I walk and carry myself that matters. You know, and some people are real true examples. Doug Rose is a great, it's such a great name. Yeah. It's such a great embodiment of that, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, of what you're saying, like she's carrying a, yourself. Yeah, she's a consciousness that you can see just by the way she walks, if you have any awareness at all. Do you, who, does Max Holloway have a chance, do you think? Oh, yeah. Man, yeah, dude. That Yeah. The, a real, he has a real those chance. Those Hawaiian fighters, dude, they, ha I mean... To me, it's like northern New Mexicans and, and Hawaiians, they've got, hmm. I never bet against. There's a savagery there, and Max is so good everywhere, too. I mean, it's like like Tony. He's like a smaller version of Tony, I think, in a way. You know, um, Ferguson, I think it's a it's a good, it, it's it's a good overlay in that kind of a fight. And that's, that's a savage mentality. You hear what he said when he got offered the fight by his manager? Mm -mm. He goes, fuck yeah. He says, this is how legends are built. Wow. Or something to that effect. This is the kind of, this is legend shit. This is, he sees an opportunity. Fuck this fight. I see this as an opportunity to be a God, mm. to be a legend right now. That's Dude, amazing. That gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Somebody asked me if I can go to the mall tomorrow. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I got to look at my schedule. I'm serious though. Uh, I don't know that I have time. Yeah. It's like, man, I don't, you know. Yeah. We'll I... see. You. I mean, if I get another <laughs> phone call, not that you're not important, but if somebody else calls, I'm not going to the mall. With you. Yeah, and so then who knows what plan I'm missing out on that a that a higher power could have looking for it's me. A trip, man. Like, All hey, I, I need you here this. to get you here. All the ways that I would have contrived my life to be would have left me. So, it's such a corny thing to say, but it's so it would have left me so short. I could not mm. have have built my life the way it is by looking at an outcome. Mm. All I could do is dig into the work that was in front of me and leave the outcome as it is all i can trust all i can move the dial on is the work i do right the work i do the excellence and the honor and integrity that i put into the work that i'm doing in present that's all i can do to worry about whether the outcome is going to be good dude it will be if that's the way i i i honor the work yeah if i'm worried about the outcome though guess what i'm not doing i'm the not work. honoring the work man I love and it. so that's all there is. I do the work. I leave the results up to the universe, man, and my life shines. And if I get that twisted, the universe never does any fucking work at all. And I'm alone, isolated in my room. It's dark, and I don't feel like I'll ever get out of this hole. Yeah. So I just got to know my role, and I got to play that, you know. And if you don't, if you're out there listening, you don't believe that exists in you. I, I, I just, I, I, I'm, 
I'm not trying to judge, but I think you're wrong. I think sometimes we don't cater to those parts of us, and it takes a while to build those muscles. And I'm not saying that I do it, but I am saying that I, when I sit here and listen to you and have this conversation, that I believe more that I can. It, it sure is worth considering. Yeah, that maybe That's there's a great another way. possibility. It sure is. You worth know, because when I got tired of going, hey man, I keep going down the same fucking road, the same consciousness, the same fucking feels like fire that's burning that's propelling me down the same and I end up at the same shitty cul-de-sac of loneliness every time and the guy goes maybe consider taking a different route and then he offers me a route and I go okay and eventually I get so sick of that that I go it's via negativa right the negative way that's how most of us learn yeah right I and 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 so if you're if your balls deep and completely the wrong thing awesome man because that's part of the process to get into the right thing mm. you know that's what I think yeah, man, it's uh. I mean, I could talk to you uh, yeah, forever. We'll talk about we'll it another it time. Yeah, we'll do it another time. Hey, remember though, Theo at, at CavemanCoffeeCo.com will get you fifteen percent off for like the next month. Yeah, let's do that, man, and we'll right. we'll share that on all, all of our elements. And uh, you can follow Tate Fletcher, um, T A I T F L E T C H E R on Instagram and almost anywhere. I'm yeah. easy to find. And good luck working on the book, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah, it's exciting. Thanks for being here, bro. All right. Bro.